we are going to continue with the pharmacology. Um, hopefully, we get to finish and then we'll have our pharmacology two exam. Then we say goodbye to pharmacology. Okay, so we are going to talk about pharmacothera pharmacotherapeutics today. And this is going to be the outline. So we'll talk about drug prescription and prescription writing. We'll look at some fundamental pharmacology calculations. We'll look at measurements and symbols. Then we'll look at the essential drug list, use of references in pharmacology. So the national treatment guidelines, the national formularies and the pharmacopoeia. Akosia. Then um, we we'll look at dosage individualization, a few practical aspects of prescribing and the pitfalls. Prescribing at the extremes of age, um, prescribing in pregnant women, breastfeeding women, drug, drug interaction, and then drug overdose. So if you have any questions along the line, jot them down when we are done, then we'll go to if we are able to make it in time, fair enough. If not, we will use the same link and then rejoin. So a prescription is basically an order that is written by the physician to tell the pharmacist what medication you want your patient to take. Now, it's important for you to bear in mind that it's not always a pharmacist who will be in the pharmacy. It might be a medicine counter assistant. It's it could be a dispensing technician. And so it's very important for you to also to have a prescription which is exact. So the components of the prescription are the name of the patient and another identifier for the sake of avoidance of errors, usually the date of birth, because two people can have the same name, but they they would most probably not have the same date of birth. So once you put those two there, you are likely to decrease the risk of um, writing the wrong prescription for the wrong patient. The prescription is also supposed to contain the medication that you intend to prescribe and then the strength. So let's say 500 milligram of... Um, um, uh, 400 milligram of metronidazole, okay? So the name of the medication is the metronidazole. The strength is the 400 milligram. And the amount to be taken, so let's say uh, 400 milligram twice a day. So that makes it 800 milligram day. The route by which it is to be taken. So you say oral metronidazole or tap metronidazole. And Ideally, in some places, you are supposed to put the amount to be given at the pharmacy and the number of refills. So let's say if you prescribe metronidazole to be taken three times a day for seven days, it means that the patient is taking three tablets in a day. And so for seven days, it means the patient is taking 21 tablets. So you're also expected to put that 21 tablet into brackets so that the medicine counter assistant will be able to know exactly how much to give. And um, these days with the electronic medical system that is available, some have an inbuilt calculator. So by the time you put in the prescription, they would calculate how many packets or tablets or um, how many meals of the medication is needed. We'll go through some examples so that we'll be able to understand this better. And then of course, you should have your signature and name at the end of every prescription. In some hospitals where we have stamps, you should ideally put your stamp on the prescription as well to make it more authentic. So these are the various rules for prescription writing. So you can write PO, that is by mouth. PR is rectum, uh, per rectum. I am is intramuscular. So let's say you can write, I am atemita. So intramuscular atemita, uh, let's say 100 milligram starts. Okay. Um, IV is intravenous. ID is intradermal. IN is intranasal. TP is topical. SL is sublingual. And BUCC is buccal. 
and IP is intraperitoneal. So let me just take this opportunity to clarify some things. Um, in the exam, you were supposed to explain what sublingual is, and some people actually interchange it with buccal. Sublingual is when the medication is put under the tongue. Buccal is when it's put in the mouth and it's absorbed into the oral mucosa. So there are two different routes of administration. Abbreviations for prescription writing. So, for example, um, one milligram um, tabutamol once daily. So, the, instead of writing the full once daily, you can write OD. Every other day has no abbreviation. So, you have to write it out in full. Then there is BID, either um, with the dots or without the dots. CID means three times a day. QID means four times a day. So, and it goes on and on like that. So this would give you describing the patient. So when the prescription is poorly written, it comes with a cost. It can lead to medication errors. And medication errors are estimated to occur approximately one in every five doses given in hospitals. Basically because it's not well written. So in writing your prescription, there are some pharmacology calculations that you'd have to um, go along with. In pediatrics, and um, specifically, the dosages are given per kilogram body weight or meter squared. So the meter squared is the same as the body surface area. The dosage calculations are among the most common pharmacy calculations. They are also some of the most important calculations to know. And differences between doses can have enormous clinical consequences. Um, if the dose is supposed to be five, and then you don't get the calculation right and you make it 10, that's a very big difference and a very big deal to the patient. And both the pharmacy technicians and pharmacists must have a robust comprehensive understanding and knowledge of dosage calculations, but as well the prescriber. So let's look at how to calculate body surface area. So calculation with the weight, that one is straightforward. If a patient requires five milligrams per kilogram body weight of a certain medication and the patient weighs 25 milligrams, then definitely the patient will require 125 milligrams of the medication, isn't it? So that one is simple. It's just the dosage per kilogram body weight times the weight of the child or the uh, patient, and then you can easily get what you need. But for the body surface area, it is the square root of the height of the patient in centimeters times the weight of the patient in kilograms divided by 3,600, okay? So let's give an example. Calculate the body surface area of a child who weighs 11.3 kilograms and is 75 centimeters tall. So the weight is 11.3, obviously, and then the height is 75 centimeters. So the body surface area is the square root of this weight times the height divided by 3,600. So that gives you 11.3 times 75 divided by 3,600. And then you work it out and you get 0 0.49. So the body surface area of the child is 0 0.49 square meters. So if you have a certain medication and they say that you should give it uh, as 500 mils per square meter, then the, it will be the, the actual dosage that you prescribe to this child will be 0 0.49 square meters times 500. Okay. So I'm going to take us through a few examples so that we understand um, exactly this calculation. So how many tablets must you prescribe to a patient who needs four tablets of a drug twice daily for six days? So four tablets twice daily will be eight tablets. Now we all know that six over seven refers to six days out of one week. So since we have eight tablets in a day, the total will be eight times six. 
that will be 48 tablets. The other example, another example, a patient enters your pharmacy asking for cough medicine. His clinician prescribed him 15 mils of medicine to be taken four times daily for seven days. What number of doses is needed and what minimum volume of cough medicine needs to be dispensed? Now, this is very important. A lot of the time in pediatrics, you realize that you prescribe medication and the pharmacist gives one bottle. The patient takes the one bottle, even though you've told them that the medication is for one week, they start taking the bottle and then somewhere three days time, the bottle is finished and they think, well, because it's finished, that's it. And these are some of the causes of um, um, treatment failure. The doses are delivered every five mils. Okay. So meaning this patient's dose of 15 mils comprises three five mil spoonfuls. So we are looking at a pediatric patient. So four times daily dosing for seven days means that you're looking at 28 doses. Okay, okay, sorry, 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 sorry. So each of these 28 doses consists of a five mil spoonful. So 28 doses times 15 mils will give you 420 mils of the cough medicine. So it means that if the cough medication is um, 100 mils, the bottle, let's say if the bottle is 200 mils, it means that they have to give more than two bottles because you need 420 mils of the cough syrup. So two bottles will be 400. So two bottles and just a little bit. So this is important. Another example, adrenaline is available as an injection of 100 micrograms per mil. A patient requires an intramuscular injection of 0 0.5 milligrams. Akosiashige me. How many mils of injection is needed to supply the required dose? I think that for these examples, if you have any concerns as I go, maybe you can stop me so that we discuss it before we get to the end. Are we okay? Yes, though. Hello? All right, good. So, adrenaline is available as an injection of 100 micrograms per mil. Stop it. Ah, and the patient requires an intramuscular injection of 0 0.5 milligrams. So how many mils of injection is needed to supply the required dose? So first of all, we need to consider whether the units are consistent. In this case, they are not because the injection comes at 100 micrograms per mil. And yet we need to give 0 0.5 milligrams. So first of all, we need to convert. So 0 0.5 times a thousand will give you 500 micrograms. I hope you are okay. So now that both are in the same unit, then you come and consider the adrenaline vial. The vial is 100 micrograms per five mils. And here is the case, you need 500 micrograms. So it means that you need five mils of the adrenaline yes. to supply the amount that the patient requires. I hope this is clear. Okay. The next example, the recommended dose of fluconazole for mucosal candidiasis in children is three milligram per kilogram daily. Um, please give me a minute. I'm coming. Kevin! 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 All right, okay. everything is okay, right? Yes, everything is okay. All right. Go ahead, eat. Kevin says Safa is ready. Go. Yay! Yeah, yeah, Oh, good girl. Bye. Okay, so um, calculate the dose needed for a child who is three years old. Um, suggest an appropriate formulation. So, um, you realize that we get the age of the child, but we didn't give the weight. And so as part of the answer, a three-year-old child has an ideal body weight of 14 kilograms. So this is where your pediatrics comes in. 
you know that an average one year old will weigh 10 kg. And every year they add two kilograms. So two years will weigh 12 kilograms. And so obviously three years will weigh 14 kilograms. So the ideal dose then is 14 kg times three milligrams. So that will give you 42 milligrams of gluconazole. And then the next question goes on to ask, what formulation should we choose? So you realize that gluconazole comes as 50 milligram, 150 milligram and 200 milligram capsules. Then we all and 200 milligram per meal suspension. So obviously capsules are out because children cannot take capsules. And so children under the age of five should preferably be administered liquid uh, formulations. Now, the most appropriate formulation is the 50 milligram per five mil of gluconazole suspension because there is 50 milligram in five mils. So each one milligram is uh, 0 0.5 mils. So if you want to give 42 milligrams of fluconazole is 42 times 0.1, and that will give you 4.2 mils. So a three-year-old should be prescribed 4.2 mils of fluconazole suspension, which comes as 50 milligrams per five mil. Okay, so to know the formulation, you usually look at the medication. You'd realize that if it's a moxiclar, for example, they've written 228 and they've written 457 per five mils. So that is the formulation. So let's say you have a two-year-old and you do the calculation and this child requires um, two to eight milligrams. Then it's better, or let's say this child requires 200 milligrams of um, the amoxicla. It's better for you to prescribe it with a two to eight milligram rather than to go and give four, five, seven, because then it's double what the child requires. So there'll be a lot of waste. I hope you get it. Another example, drug X needs to be dosed at 15 milligram per kilogram daily in two divided doses. So these dosages, we would usually find them in the DNF as we'll come to. So calculate the dose for a six month old child and the volume of pediatric injection to be dispensed. Drug X is available in a formulation of 50 milligrams in five minutes. So here too, the ideal body weight of a six month old is 7.6 kilogram. And this is because if you look at an average weight of between three and 3.5, the six month old will double their weight. And so that is what you arrive at. So given that the dose is 15 milligram per one kg, then 7.6 is equivalent to 15 times 7.6. And that would be 114 milligrams. So we know that the quantity of drug X that we need is 114 milligrams. So we need to find out how many mils of the available formulation delivers this 114 milligrams. So it's just simple proportion. So if 50 milligrams is in one mil, then uh, one milligram contains zero point then zero point zero two mil contains one milligram so you multiply that by one one four and that will give you two point two eight um however the question specified that the drug x needs to be given in two divided doses and so that means that your two point two eight mil is your daily dose so you divide it into two and give one point one four mil in two divided doses. Okay, I hope we are clear on that. Next example, what oral dose of methotrexate is suitable for a five-year-old child weighing 18 kilograms? The oral dose of methotrexate is 15 milligram per meter squared. So first, we need to learn what the ideal body surface area of a five-year-old child is. And this is available in charts. If you take the BNF and you look at the back of the BNF, you see a table of body surface area. So checking from there, yes, you don't like the food you're in. 
me my own. So, so taking from there, you realize that the ideal body surface area for a five-year-old child is 0 0.74 meters squared. So you multiply the 15 by the 0 0.74. And then, um, yeah, so when you do that calculation, simple proportion, then you realize that the dosage is 15 by that proportion, and that would be 11.1 .1 milligrams. Okay. Another example, formulation X contains 9.2. So this, this kind of question helps, this kind of calculation helps with when you have multivitamin and you're trying to determine which more the amount of vitamin x contains 9.25 um, formulation x contains 9.25 milligram of vitamin a as retinal acetate and 400 micrograms of ego calciferol, that's vitamin D. And then formulation Y contains 2,240 international use of vitamin A and 10 micrograms of vitamin D. So you realize that this one is in uh, international units. This one is in milligrams. So um, the question is, which formulation contains the greatest vitamin concentration? Note that the units are not equivalent. So for vitamin A, one international unit is 0 0.344 micrograms. So if you have a, a drug containing 9.25 milligram of vitamin A, then we must convert this to mini micrograms. And that will give you 9250 micrograms. And when you convert it to international units, you get 26. 1890 international units. But you realize that the formulation Y contains 2240. So this is 26,000. Okay. Then when you come to the ego calciferol, you realize that the same quantity of vitamin D is found in both. When you go back to the question, this one contains and 400 international units of ego calciferol. And then the Y contains 10 micrograms. So um, when you multiply, when you do the conversion, you realize that the amount of vitamin D is the same. But then the amount of vitamin A is higher in the X because it is 26,892. So you'd realize that the formulation X contains more vitamins than the formulation and um, why. So we move on to measurements and symbols. And in pharmacology, the most commonly used is a metric system. And usually this is in reference to volume and weight. And sometimes you may need to convert the units. So volume is defined as the amount of space that the substance occupies. So when we refer to volume, we are referring to liquid measures, example, five mils. So in the metric system, the volume has two units. We usually use mils and then liters. And we know that there are a thousand mils in one liter. When it comes to weight, it has to do with the uh, heaviness of the matter. And it is a solid measure, for example, five grams. And in the metric system, we have kilograms, we have milligrams, we have micrograms. And you know that there are a thousand micrograms in one milligram. There is a thousand milligram in one gram and a thousand grams in one kilogram. So these four units, you interchange them. But when you realize that the units are different, then you convert so that you make the calculation easier. So we have kilograms, we have grams, we have milligrams, and then we have micrograms. So looking at the essential drug list in Ghana, um, the essential drug list is um, 
those medicines that satisfy the priority healthcare needs of the population. So when you look at the essential drug list, it's like the most important list of drugs that you need, the basic drugs that you need in the facility. And they are selected with regard to public health relevance. And then evidence on efficacy, safety, and then cost effectiveness. We know that cost is always a challenge. And the essential medicines list, the list derived from the standard treatment guidance. So the basic, when it comes to pharmacology, if you don't have anything at all, at least you need the essential drug list and then the standard treatment guidance. And the medicines have been coded according to the Health Commodity Codes Catalog of the Ministry of Health. And it contains information about the levels of use. That is, maybe this medication by the level of a, a physician, by the level of a special. Then it's also based on the type of health facility, whether it's a chips compound, whether it's a district hospital, a regional hospital, and so on. So it even includes midwifery practice as well. It's very important for all of us to have prescribing references. And the commonly available ones are the standard treatment guidelines, the British national formulary, and various pharmacopoeia from different countries. And um, these ones contain medication side effects, the formulations and the dosage. There are several medications that we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. And so for, for, for you, the most important thing is to know that, okay, if the patient has malaria, if I'm able to come to the diagnosis of, of malaria, I need to use uh, maybe artesanate or artemisal infantrine to treat. As to the exact dosages, you have all these prescribing references there for you to quickly consult. The more you consult them, the, 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 the more it sticks. And so you're able to remember offhand, offhand. But there's nothing wrong with um, going into the... And it's most important for you to also check side effects so that when you're counseling the patients about the medication, you know exactly what to tell them to look out for. There are few pitfalls in prescription writing. And the common types of errors in prescription writing is incomplete information on the prescription. So somebody writes a prescription, you don't put the weight on the prescription form. You don't put the age of the patient. It's incomplete. And ideally, the pharmacist should return the patients to you about the correct dosing. Then errors with the dose and the strength. So if you remember your ethics, um, your ethics question, there was a question about a patient who was prescribed digoxin. It's supposed to, it was supposed to be 0 0.1 milligrams. And then the decimal point shifted and then they gave 10 milligrams. So that's a serious, um, prescription error, then incorrect timing of doses. Instead of the medication being given twice a day, you write three times a day. Then failure to arrange appropriate monitoring of prescribed drugs. So you know, for example, that if you prescribe um, quinine to a patient, quinine can cause hypoglycemia. So you know the nurses are supposed to be monitoring the sugar level so that if it goes low, they quickly intervene. If you, are, if you don't institute these measures, you end up having um, errors. The risk of prescription writing increases with the number of pairs, uh, medicines the patient is taking. So each additional medicine increases the risk by 16%. And then the patient's age is also another risk factor for errors. Children and um, those over 75 are twice as likely to have an error. And then the type of medicine prescribed. Sometimes the size of the medication is similar to another one. So then instead of taking this one, they end up taking that, that one because they are similar. 
or even maybe they are both in the same container or they have the same color. It's important for us to understand the need for dosage individualization. And this is one reason why you cannot take um, medication that has been prescribed for your spouse because they, they are complaining of headaches. So you to when you get a headache, you think that is the same thing though, because there's a need for dosage individualization. And this takes into cognizance the fact that each person is unique. Each person has a relevant medical history. Each person has a medical condition which is peculiar to them. And that will alter the kind of dosage that is given. So these determinants are the age of the patient, the sex of the patient, um, diet that the patient is on, relevant medical history, whether the patient has kidney problems, liver issues, and so on. We know the liver and the kidney are responsible for metabolism and elimination of drugs. So at all times, it is prudent to start with low doses of medication and titrate up accelerated and if required. So let's say that a patient has fever. You can give maybe three times a day. If it's not getting better, then you can do it three times a day or four times a day. You can go all the way to every four hours. But you don't start off by giving it every four hours. You start from the lower dose. And depending on the response of the patient, you move up as necessary. And it's always important to consider non-medical treatments for conditions. So let's say a patient who has just been diagnosed with hypertension, the blood pressure is not so high. We know that there are certain interventions that help to decrease blood pressure. For example, diet rich in potassium. So you can start off with non-medical treatment and see how um, it resolves before you move to giving medication. When it comes to the extremes of age, we know that dosages in children are age and weight specific. So for example, if you have them, um, let's say a newborn, and you are prescribing gentamicin for the newborn, we would usually make it five milligram per kilogram body weight daily. The same gentamicin, if you are giving it to a five-year-old child, you would give 2.5 milligram per kilogram body weight three times a day. So you realize that the medication, the dosage of the medication is based on the age of the patient in addition to the weight. Okay. Now, some drugs are also contraindicated at the extremes of age. Um, so an example, we don't give ketrazone to newborns because um, of bilirubin binding and the risk of neonatal jaundice and kinetics. Also, the elderly might have heart disease, which would impair their cardiovascular function. You don't want to move from there. Which one? Mommy, are you on? Which would impair their cardiovascular function? then um, they have so, slower metabolism. So you would, you would expect that the medication will not be cleared as quickly as you would see in a younger person. Okay, so we'll talk about pregnancy. Um, there are two important considerations when you are prescribing drugs during pregnancy. So this is the effect of the drug on the fetus or the mother. And then the effect of the pregnancy on the drug. We'll explain this in due course. Another important consideration is the timing of the medication in the pregnancy. When we're doing um, pathology, we looked at the fact that there are teratogens. And these teratogens, depending on the time of the pregnancy that they are introduced, they can have different effects. So for example, if you give a drug during the first trimester, the damage will be worse or it, it might be more compared to the same drug being given 
in the last trimester, let's say 39 weeks. And so these are important things. Once you know that the patient is pregnant, ask yourself, what is this drug going to do to the mother? What is this drug going to do to the unborn child? And then also ask yourself, how is the metabolism of this drug in the body affected by the pregnancy? And then at what time during this pregnancy would it be safest to give the medication? So there's what we call the dysmorphic calendar. And it's important for us to understand the progression during pregnancy. So 12 to 40 days, if you give any medication which is teratogenic, it can cause limb reduction because this is the time that the limbs are forming. 24 days, you can have an encephaly. 34 days, there, there can be transposition of the great vessel so that instead of the um, aorta arising from the left ventricle, it will arise from the right ventricle, like they'll be interchanged. At 36 days, the possibility of cleft lip is high. And then um, syndactyly is also high at 42 days. And then hypospadias, the positioning of the uterine opening at the dorsal part, at the ventral part of the penis. Okay, so fetal growth can be affected at any stage. From day zero to 17, there's fertilization and implantation. This is a very crucial or critical stage in the fetal growth. Then from 18 to 55 days, most major organ systems are formed. The development of the reproductive system continues up to 84 days. And so once you have these things in mind, when you're giving medication, you try and look at the first 84 days of life. Um, let me see, 84 divided by um, seven, what, how many weeks? Uh -huh. So the first 12 weeks, okay, that's the first trimester, basically. If, if you can, avoid giving medication during the first trimester, except medications that are known to be safe during pregnancy. So a few examples of teratogen. So if the patient is already on phenytoin or carbamazepine before they got pregnant, you have to change it to something else. Um, so lithium is there, sodium valproate, warfarin, retinoid. Okay, we have less than a minute. So I'm going to end the meeting. Or no, I'm no longer the host, so I can't end the meeting. Nick, can you end the meeting and then we rejoin? All right, Doc. I'll do so. All right.